Welcome to Real Estate Coaching Radio, starring award-winning real estate coaches and number one international best-selling authors, Tim and Julie Harris. Real Estate Coaching Radio is the nation's number one daily radio show for realtors who demand authentic real-time coaching. Get ready for fluff-free, unfiltered, full-strength honesty about what's truly working to get you into action, helping others, and making money now in today's real estate market. Now to our hosts, Tim and Julie Harris. Three, two, one, and we are back. It is August the 19th, and Julie and I are live, uh, just off a bunch of coaching calls, and I have to say I'm rather pumped up because some of the things I'm learning. Um, so as always, our podcast is in three sections. The first one is going to be any headlines that you know grabbed our attention, which I don't know if I want to spend a lot of time on headlines. Do you? Is there um, anything in particular? No, but and, I, I, and, the, and the second part is telling you guys what we are experiencing on our coaching calls. And the last part, we try to give you guys practical and tactical takeaway information so you can be, you know, put yourself in place to help others and make money. Sorry, Julie. That's okay. Well, so with regards to headlines, the only thing that I would say is there's a lot of head cl- headlines that start out very dramatic, like, you know, 8 million people protected from foreclosure or whatever, yep. which kind of a lot of the headlines make it sound like there's 8 million people headed for foreclosure. Then you get deeper in the article and it talks about all the stimulus and all of the, um, you know, the fact that nobody really wants a housing crisis on top of everything else. And about halfway through most of these articles, it turns pretty positive. So if you are sucked into any of those headlines, make sure you read it for content, not just for the headline. Well, yeah, and I've been reading these too. And so it is kind of funny. Yesterday, we were talking about U.S. housing starts surged by 23% in July. Yeah. And today, all the headlines are basically about the gloom and doom that's on the horizon. Right. And the thing that you guys all you got to remember is two things can be true at once. They're absolutely, mm-hmm. it's what Julie and I, you know, it's bifurcation of the market. And that's what you're going to really be seeing. There's always been bifurcation of you know, virtually everything in life, wealth and all the rest of it. That's just, the, you know, how things naturally work out. But now I think we're going to see some very distinct bifurcation. You're going to see, uh, it just, I'll give you guys some examples from my coaching calls today here mm-hmm. in a second. But there's, um, as far as this extend and pretend thing, as far as all of what's happening with regards to the government intervention, as Julie and I, I think, frankly, uh, correctly predicted back in March, There really is not going to be an end to all the government, you call it what you want, intervention, quantitative easing, stimulus, yada, 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 CARES Act 5, CARES Act 6. There will never be an end to it. There's not going to be a day where the politicians are going to say, okay, we cared before, but we don't care now. The non-CARES Act. That's right. Now it's the don't give a crap act. And so now we're going to stop (laughs) giving money. So at this point, like I heard something yesterday on another podcast that something like $18 trillion in one form or another, at 17 actually. Was, has been injected into the economy mm-hmm. since February. That's ridiculous because the total GDP for the entire country is something like $21 trillion. Yeah. So really since February, there's been money that's been injected into the economy that was not just part of people essentially buying and selling, not, not from goods or services being produced, but the government producing money, government making money and injecting it into the economy. And I don't know if you guys have ever thought about this. I had this little epiphany yesterday. That if you and I, all of us, we just decide, no, and we're not going to do this. I'm just giving you guys an example that we're going to fire up our color printers and we're going to start making money. Obviously, that's illegal, right? You know, somebody from the Treasury Department would certainly be slipping some handcuffs on you if you all of a sudden decide to make your own, uh, you know, fake U.S. currency. Well, why is it illegal? Because essentially, if you can create your own money, it devalues the real money that's out there because, you know, obviously people then will wonder whether they have real money or fake money. Well, so it's illegal. Very clear. Everyone knows that. It is still funny that people still try to do that, though. I know. I know. I mean, it's out there for Yeah, I mean, I I remember one time when you and I were in Las Vegas and Uh we were grocery shopping or whatever, and this happened for years. Yeah. And you'd take, if you paid with like a 20 or a 50 or something, Mm -hmm. they were, all of a sudden you were, you know, essentially under the magnifying glass and they were checking the, you know, the bill and the whole thing was just ridiculous. But just because there's, you know, there was a lot of counterfeit currency. Well, how is that different than if, for example, and this is just sort of a mindset thing, but how is it different than what the Fed's doing, injecting almost $20 trillion in the economy? They just fired up their printer. and Because it's legal for them. That's how it's different. Uh, Exactly. Obviously, (laughs) it's legal for them. But then ultimately, that creates this sort of, you know, your value, the value of your money and my money goes down. 
And then this is the bifurcation of the everything that's going on right now because of all the stimulus money is causing things not to make sense like you think they would. The dominoes don't fall the same direction that they normally would. Gravity doesn't work the same way that Isaac Newton observed it to fall it to work. So you have the stock market that's going crazy. And what's happening is, and the belief is, a lot of the money that's essentially being injected into the economy, as it did back in 08, is going into assets. And the stock market's one of the safest ways of, or really the cleanest places for people to put money if they have no or at little confidence that their dollar is going to retain value. So if you have a hundred dollars and you're relatively certain that hundred dollars is only going to have you only going to give you in a month ninety dollars of buying value. In other words, you go to the grocery store today, you buy a hundred dollars of the groceries. If you have to go to the grocery store with that same hundred dollar bill in thirty days and only buys you say you know eighty five dollars worth of groceries, well then you're going to want to put that hundred dollars in some place where there's at least a better uh, chance that it's going to have that same level of buying power. It's that simple. And so people start putting their money into assets, real estate, for example. You know, and, and okay, and then it's re, you know reeling it back into real estate. Julie's giving me a concerned look. She thinks I'm too far ahead of my skis. <laughs> okay, <laughs> seeing where we're going. I know. Well, then you reel it back into real estate, and then there's headlines from today that talking about like what Julie was saying. You know, as far as the HUD to extend foreclosure ban protecting 8.1. A million people till 2021. Well, that is a significant headline. And as Julie yeah. said, you got to read it in the meats and potatoes of it. But the moral of the story is there are 8.1 million people that are not going to have to worry about foreclosure. It's government intervention. If there were, if it was allowed to be a natural clearing of the market and from a you know humanistic perspective, that would be very ugly and it would be very mm -hmm. ugly for the economy. But there is going to be a price to pay for the extension of the of people not you know clearing out of their properties. That means there's going to be a lot of people not making payments. That means there's going to be a lot of markets that are going to be um, like when you go do a CMA on a, a housing market and you're you know trying to assess value. You don't know whether the houses you're using as comps are, are going to be people that are in essentially going to be in foreclosure uh, as soon as the foreclosure moratoriums end. So the whole market is very skewed and very sort of become very opaque mm -hmm. because of all the government intervention. And, and it just, it's going to, this is not going to go away. This is just going to be the new way it, if everything is going to be until something else comes around and causes the government to hypothetically no longer be able to continue to print money to boost up the economy because they can't stop printing money. They won't be able to continue. I mean, again, I, I think don't... it's like the great bet that's on, right? So the bet is that we can make it to the point where there's a vaccine or something that's as good as a vaccine. And that on that day, the economy will then, you know, come roaring back and correct for whatever could have been. It's like that. That's what people you know, are hoping that, for. I think that's the great that's the gamble, fantasy. right? That's the yeah. great gamble. And, and how long can we keep this whole, you know, all the stimulus and the forbearances and all? Can that ride out to the point where we get to that point? And then we avoid everything hitting the fan. I don't know. I don't know. I, but I think that's the great gamble. Well, here's saying. another headline. And this is just giving you guys how you know much time we spend trying to make sure we're giving you good information. Hotels are headed for a historic level for closure, lodging group warns. And I was, I didn't, I don't remember the particulars, but you don't have to open it up, Julie. It doesn't matter. But it was a huge number of hotels that are basically in foreclosure. They're going to be in foreclosure, going out of business. You guys get the gist of it. Yeah. And yet the stock market is going crazy. And yet, property values and are so going crazy. Gold, all at the same time. Yeah. You see, that's the bifurcation. Bifur and remember, two things can be true at the same time. Matter of fact, three things can be true at the same time. So you can have all this. So don't allow your brain to think that, okay, one, one group of people are, are telling me the truth and the other group of people are lying. Don't start thinking like that. Realize that all of these things can happen simultaneously. And they are happening simultaneously. And they are going to happen simultaneously in your town in your market, right? So be aware of all these things. But at the same time, like I was on, Julie, moving forward, I was on a coaching yeah. call with uh, Rob Johnson, who's mm -hmm. the number one agent in Greenwich, Connecticut, mm -hmm. one of the top agents in all of the United States. He is going to, last year, he did something like $140 million, just him and a wonderful assistant, um, an assistant and a half, really. That's how we train people to, you know, that's what we have them do. We teach them to run incredibly profitable businesses using incredibly, uh, essentially efficient teams, not big of an inefficient teams where no one knows where it's on, who's on first and the profit margins are terrible. We focus on massive profit margins. We are not anti-team. We are pro-team, but we are pro-profitable team. So yes, be clear uh, on that. There is a rule in Harris Rules called your product is profit. And Rob is a great example of that. That's right. And all of our great coaching clients, the ones that have been with us a long time, 
and that aren't all easily uh, persuaded into believing the malarkey about you know ego marketing and all mm-hmm. that. But we're not going to digress into that. <laughs> His market, who, who, in Greenwich, has been on his heels for years. There's been in his market, it was not unusual for him to go on a listing appointment where the seller was going to lose 30, 40, in some cases, 50 percent of what they paid. Yeah. It, it, the market had gotten so used to big losses that it wasn't even a point of contention on listing appointments where he had to, you know, con- get the seller to realize that they were going to lose all this money. They just knew it, mm-hmm. you know. And so that's what happens in a, in a sort of mature buyer's market. And, the, and there was no sign of Greenwich going in any different direction. Um, and it was just going to continue like that forever. And then COVID hit. And then guess what happens? People move the heck out of New York City. And they, they're moving all over the East Coast. They're moving to Charleston, South Carolina, Florida. Some of them are moving down to Puerto Rico because the world has woken up to the fact, you know, and, and COVID was the pin that broke the bubble. But they're realizing, you know what? I don't need to live in New York City and pay all the taxes and the cost of living and the inconveniences and, oh, yeah, COVID, because now I can work virtually. And all these companies are saying, you know what? Work virtually. It's great because guess what? Now that, you know, all this technology like um, Verbella and, you know, like Zoom, all these technologies made it so people can work virtually. These companies are saying, huh, we can have everyone work out of their house. We don't have to pay all these fixed costs and these leases. And you know what? This is better for us as a business. So we, we don't need to be stuck to this paradigm where people get up at 5 a.m. and they take some train followed by a cab and, you know, carrier pigeon to get to work by, you know, 730 in the morning and they work there for eight hours. That mm-hmm. paradigm that genie is, you know what, guys? I How many people are going to want to go back to living the way they did before? Nobody will. And so you see areas like Greenwich, Connecticut who are, that are going through the roof. And again, we have coaching clients mostly on the East Coast, mostly from you know, the center of the United States, East, that are having their markets, which were forgotten about markets for the most mm-hmm. part, passed over markets for the most part, are taking off. And you think that before, no one knew whether that was going to be a small trend, but now it's obviously a macro trend. Clearly. yes. And look at New York City as a result. 13,000 vacancies. It, I think we had an article that we put up on our mm-hmm. website, timandjulieharris.com, that shows New York City is now, what, number one or number two in the nation for foreclosure filings. Yes, I read an article this morning that somebody had interviewed a uh, prominent moving truck company in L.A., and they said that the flight away from L.A., especially from, you know, they had a few neighborhoods that they named, was epic. I mean, they, that's the person to interview, right? People that, that are actually making the moves. Also, uh, San Francisco has a lot of flight right now. So, you know, and meanwhile, there's some of these previously second or third level markets. They're the ones that are starving for inventory because stuff is selling so fast. It's it's just amazing what's going on out there. Yeah. So, yeah, so two things can happen at once. And, and what's happening in, you know, your backyard is probably not what's happening in the city next to you. Right. So you have to be very careful studying your subject property. And I think the other thing that I'm seeing from coaching clients is that comps have gotten a lot harder. For sure. Because you have people that are in pre-foreclosure, right, that are like ready to get out. And, you know, yes, they'll price it a little bit less, but maybe it gets bid up. Then you have people who have waived the appraisal and it closes for a lot more. So when you're looking up comps, it doesn't say why they sold. It doesn't say the circumstances of the sale. You've got to really know your comps. And that's why we advise people as best you can to preview everything you're doing and to look at what you're competing with. If, so. so if I'm listening to this podcast and I'm an agent in you know anywhere USA and I'm hearing all this information, I'm saying, well, this is sort of intellectually interesting and stimulating, but how do I make it tactical and practical? I think the only answer is, is you got to really know your market. And also, guys, you need to be thinking, and I know this is kind of scary for some of you, you need to be thinking strategically whether or not you're, you know, where you want to be where a year from now in your present situation, is that exactly how you want everything to be? You might want to start thinking about whether you're one of the agents and one of the humans, basically, that are still struggling with trying to make the old normal come back again, mm-hmm. or whether or not you're embracing all the, frankly, the amazing things that are happening from the new normal. And there always are going to be people that are trying to hold on to the old reality. Yeah, we talk about all the you know example, but the best example I have is school. I mean, and with my beautiful wife who I'm looking at right now, I mean, she and you guys, if you're regular listeners to the podcast, you could hear the consternation in her voice, especially on our Sunday yeah, podcast. I don't like it. Where we're talking about <laughs> school in particular, right? Julie yeah. comes from a family of school teachers. They're all school teachers, right? Yeah. They all walk around slide rules in their front pockets, basically. Yeah. 
No, your dad Back did when have that a, was a thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Now there people are saying like, "What's a slide rule?" I know. Now there's an app for that. Yeah, exactly. But that so when we were talking back in February, March, and we were starting to see schools not coming back and all the rest of it, Julie was like, "Nope, kids, it's always going to school. It's first grade. She's gonna be standing in line like I did back in the '80s, and this is how it's gonna be." But now she said yesterday, and podcast listeners, you actually heard her say it for the first time, by the way, mm-hmm. that she actually likes Zoe being at home. I do. She actually she actually likes the homeschool thing, and especially here's- for the little kids. I think that there's as much, maybe more value in them having that, you know, side by side attention and you know individual learning. But she's getting what would have been a whole day's worth of first grade done in like two hours. Well, that's an extreme example, but basically, you know, you can because how much of the time is the teacher wrangling them up and getting them to sit down and doing all these things that really don't give her the value intellectually that she needs. Well, so, right. If someone has multiple kids, then it's not so easy, right? It's right. not such an easy thing. It's just not a snap of your fingers and it's a one-size-fits-all type solution. And there's going to be hybrids of all these different options. But, look, there's a very realistic – I read an article this morning that was talking about um, – any vaccine. When, whenever there's really going to be a vaccine, hopefully it's going to be sometime like maybe mid-year next year, right? But the vaccine is going to be, are you guys going to stand in line for the vaccine first? Yeah, when they come up sign up for that? Right? Who's, me out. Who wants to be the first one in line for that? Are you guys going to do it? Are you going to put your kids up there? Are you going to have your kids take the vaccine? No. So what could, and by the way, the vaccine is being made for adults right now. It's not being made for children. Yeah. It's not being made for pregnant ladies. So what we're seeing is there's not going to be a hard stop to the you know COVID right. insanity. This is going to be essentially something that's going to follow us the rest of our lives in one form or another. So don't fight it. Embrace it. Look to, and, and if you're realizing, look, how much does your life, again, I know some of you are, have, are sort of you know emotionally and financially even suffering and hopefully not physically suffering. But the reality of it is, is going forward, what is starting to emerge is so much better than what was in so many different ways. I hope you guys are at least emotionally trying to attach well, to that. I think a lot of, especially in our industry, you know, agents have, I think that for the first month or two where it was a little bit scarier, I think now agents, by and large, the smart ones have really adapted well. And I think there have been a lot of good things. One of the things that I see in coaching is agents that never would have been comfortable asking for a buyer agency agreement are totally comfortable now because they just add it to the COVID disclosures. Right. You know, so that's something that you couldn't have made up to get them to do that. Right. So that's a good thing. They're really heavily pre-qualifying buyers before they sign up to go show them a property. There's some good stuff from this. Let me give you an example. Right. So um, we watched the Formula One race last, Mm -hmm. last weekend in Spain. Right. Yep. Kind of boring, but we watched it. Mm-hmm. And so I read a report and that the number of people that watched that Formula One race was like 5x compared to normally watch it and attend. So there's more That's people awesome. watching Formula One right now than were consuming it before even going live mm-hmm. to the actual event or watching it on TV. Well, that's true for everything. Our yes. podcast listenership has gone through the roof. I'm hearing, well, EXP Realty did, uh, what was it, Shareholder Summer Summit back in the spring, and they opened it up to everyone. There was, you know, essentially free education, the whole thing. And I don't remember the multiple, but they had... It was norm- way huger, though. Normally, you know, 2,500 people or whatever would, you know, take the trip down to Orlando and then go to Shareholder Summit. And now, I don't remember again, it was an enormous number of people that attended because it was all available on online mm-hmm. guys this is the type classical of- music is up too by the way is like it really massively tell up. me um you know people that track podcasts and downloads and, and what people are listening to all the classic you know classical music mozart and bach and beethoven and all that is like the highest downloads ever recorded well well here think about this so it's awesome right- and, and furthermore they the there's I don't know how they track this, but they said that Generation Z is the greatest consumer of classical music right now. Oh, in case you guys didn't know it, Julie used to play in a classical orchestra. She was a professional so like musician, so she likes it, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, but before you know, maybe that that same person that's trying it out. Maybe they weren't going to go to a live concert because that was just a little bit too out of their wheelhouse. Do you remember our theory that we're on the precipice of what's going to be a renaissance? Yep, you can So tell. you and I are, without knowing it, we are just giving elements of basically people reconnecting with the things yes. that make humans and humanity, the 4% of mm-hmm. us humans and not the 96% of us that yeah. are like monkeys, right? Absolutely. So it almost seems like we're starting to see more and more people latch onto that. But I was mm-hmm. thinking of something practical and tactical. Sure. So back when we sold real estate, if you had to go on 
I mean, one up- listing appointment, you know, you do enough of them, it's no longer stressful. It gets to be boring, especially when you're following our listing presentation, because frankly, boring and predictable. It's boring and predictable with the result of them signing the contract. That's what you want. You don't want emotionally stressful. <laughs> you want boring, boring and predictable. Boring in a good way. Yes. Boring in a good way, right. That's how basically our, our our real estate system works. It's boring and predictable that gives you a predictable, duplicatable outcome, which causes you to make money consistently, right? That's called a mm-hmm. business. But I remember after there was a while, maybe for like two years, not every single week, but we were having to go on more like sometimes two and three listing appointments a day. And that means effectively you couldn't get anything else done in the day. That means effectively you were exhausted at the end of the day because you had to go there. You had to do a little bit of performance. Even if you were following our listing presentation, it was still, there was still a certain level of, you know. It was the event of the day for sure. Right, exactly. And, you know, the whole thing was kind of stressful, right? So what we did then soon, right now, you guys can start going on multiple listing appointments a day from in front of your computer. Yeah, wouldn't that have been awesome? Yes. Oh, my gosh. Think how much more we could have done. Absolutely. How about this? I'm an agent listening right now, right? And I'm chasing listing appointments. Why don't you guys start thinking about, or we'll think about it for you and just give it to you, a way that someone can literally, between the hours of you know 1 and 3 o'clock, if they want to hear what you're going to do to sell the house, they can just jump on a live Zoom that you're hosting every single day. Yep. Well, why not think like essentially like that? How can you just, dissem- if someone takes our pre-listing pack, and you cannot use our pre-listing pack unless you paid for the license to use it. You cannot steal it in, co- you know, it's copywritten information. I want to make that really clear. Right. Don't even think about it. Right. So you you send the pre-listing pack ahead of time in physical copy. You then you can do our whole listing presentation over a Zoom. You can do the whole process. You could even, and I was thinking about this, one of the key elements that we always suggest agents do is we suggest that they actually walk around the house with the seller. Mm-hmm. Well, why don't you FaceTime while they walk around the house while you're recording, while you're asking questions? Some of questions. our agents are doing that. Exactly. It's awesome. Do you guys look at this, how this is better? And they, they actually, I you know, the ones that I've heard doing that, it's strange that they almost bond more. You know, the ones that are all worried about building rapport because they're not live. Right. There's something about if you're the homeowner and you're walking somebody through and showing all the cool stuff that you've done from the house and the things that you like and notice this and notice that. It's like you bring their energy and enthusiasm to you. Right. And now it becomes harder for them not to be like plausible, you. Not right. to like you. And they're you. not nervous because you're not in the house. But but here's yeah, the thing like that, that ultimately too. this does think about this. Yeah. If you're not somebody who has a formal listing process, a formal listing presentation, and your way of getting the listing is going in there and doing your cat and monkey and show. That's and that's all you've got. And you're, you know, and, and charming them and talking about the fact you both have golden retrievers. <laughs> good luck doing that over a Zoom. You're not going to do it. Again, in this day of technology, what you're going to see is a bifurcation. You're going to see agents who are going to use a formalized pr- uh, process like what we and Julie have to do a great job in Premier. The, <laughs> she's walking out of the studio. If you guys are in Premier Coaching, make sure you attend live. By the way, if you're not in our Premier Coaching program, there is a version of our Premier Coaching program, which is definitely a scaled back version, that it is free and you can join it. Free. Did I mention it doesn't cost anything? That's what free means. <laughs> Just text the word survival to 31996. Text the word survival to 31996. Again, text the word survival to 31996. So listen, listeners, start thinking big. Start realizing that there is no, there's not going to be a snapback. It's going to be, even if there is a, you know, some sort of vaccine or a viable therapy, people emotionally will not go back. Julie's not in the studio anymore, so I can say this confidently. She is never going to want to go back to basically the daily drudge of having to deal with taking Zoe to school and all the rest of it. And a lot of you are going to feel the exact same way, right? And then that's going to free you up to say, you know what? I chose this neighborhood because uh, you know we needed a place to work and we needed these schools and all these decisions were made predicated on belief structure that might not exist anymore. You chose the house, you chose the property tax bill, you chose to pay the price because you wanted to have a certain set of amenities, right? Tangible and intangible. You like the house, hopefully, but you also wanted the kids to go to school in a certain area. You also need to be able to drive to work and didn't want to sit in a car or train or whatever for a thousand years. But now hasn't all that changed? If you don't have to live there, are you going to live there? Look what's happening in New York City. Look what's happening in LA. Look what's happening in these major city centers. People are getting out. And they're not, look, they're using the excuse because they're afraid of COVID. But that's not the real reason. The real reason is because they now know they have options. Their employers are giving them options. They're choosing to maybe even scale down their lifestyles in some examples. I know, um, you know, I just had a, a really good friend of mine. He moved, he just moved up to Montana. He's from San Diego. He's probably listening today. I won't use his name. 
and he's very successful, multi, multi-millionaire. And he decided to move up to Montana. And he's, you know, I'm sure he scaled back his lifestyle, but that's what he chose for himself. And he can do that because of the fact that he works virtually. Nobody gives a rat's butt where he is, whether he's in San Diego, whether he's in Austin, whether he's in New York, or whether he's in Montana. Nobody knows. I was talking with him on Saturday and all of a sudden he stops talking. And then I, I, I said, are you still there? And he goes, I am. I was just taking pictures of deer, right? I mean, if any of you guys live in 99% of the country, deer are about as common as birds. But this poor soul from San Diego had never actually seen live deer running around. So for him in his mid-50s to see three deer together was like seeing a UFO for you know people like most of us are. But I, anyway, I just digress. Any, no, only someone from Southern California would have thought it was picture worthy to take, uh, you know, a, a three deer. That's just kind of funny. You guys have to admit, but that's the type of thing that he'd always wanted to experience. That's the lifestyle that in his heart and his soul, he always wanted to have. And he sounded really, really happy. How many of you guys are seeing your markets bifurcate, change, go in different directions? How many of you want to do the same thing? How many of you are thinking about, you know what? I always wanted to fill in the blank. Well, why don't you start seriously taking, here's the beauty of real estate. Well, when you have skills, frankly, you can live anywhere. If Look, if your uh, business is so invested on marketing and on a particular geographic area and postcards and all this sort of stuff that is low skilled, it's passive lead generation, you can't leave as easily because you don't have any portable skills because everything's predicated on you being in that ge- uh, that same geographic area. But for those of you who have actually taken the time to master your skills and be proactive lead generators, those skills are scalable. You can take them anywhere. My friend San Diego, he can take his exact skill set, proactive lead generation. He can go up to Montana and he can apply it. Julie and I did that. We moved out of Ohio. We've lived in many different states. Because when you know how to actually generate your own business and you don't have to buy your buyer leads and you don't have to mail postcards, you don't have to you know, do all this passive stuff hoping and praying something works for some social networking scheme that you're working on. When you know how to proactively lead generate, you are one step closer to being free. You are one step closer to no longer having to live in the same area that you were probably born in. You know, it was the statistic, I think it's 93% of everyone. This is an older statistic and maybe it's changed, but you'll get the gist of it. Are, you know, they're born and they die within a 25 mile radius of the same exact spot. I'm not saying that's good. and I'm not saying it's bad, but that's evidence of the fact that people have been living in this sort of predictable lifestyle, not just because that's where their families are, because that wasn't always the case, but it's because where they had all these close tie-in connections. Now through technology, and really it's because, again, uh, of COVID has allowed all these technologies now to go from in the shadows to becoming prime time. Now it's okay to be on Zoom, right? It's Look, all these conferences, I was just telling you about a Formula One race. I don't know whether people are going to want to you know, spend the time and the money to go back and watch Formula One live. I mean, it's a different experience than watching it on TV, but is it really that different? Is it worth the cost and the hassle? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But these are the types of thoughts and decision-making processes that people are going to start going through. And I think that as a real estate practitioner, you got to take a real hard look at A, your own area. Make sure you're knowing what's going to happen. If you're living in a very dense urban environment, and you better be paying attention to what the, uh, the migration is doing. What is it? Uh, Mayflower Van Lines does one of the best um, reports on what cities in the country, Google it, that have the most people moving in and moving out. I think it's Mayflower. We always do the, they come out with a story every year. Um, but it's obvious, right? There's migration out of the urban, you know, densely populated areas. And then people are moving from California. They're moving up to Oregon. Well, Oregon in, in the big cities, they're moving out of the big cities now. They were moving, a lot of people from um, California were moving to Austin, Texas. But now Austonians are tired of the traffic. And frankly, all the Californians moving there. And so they're starting to push out into the areas around Austin because, again, they don't have to live in those extremely expensive and dense areas. And they're wanting to have, you know, a place where they can have some breathing room. And by the way, where things cost less, including property taxes. So these are the types of macro trends that change the landscape and it doesn't go back because once you've experienced having a better quality of lifestyle that requires less stress, that requires, frankly, less work in many cases, why would you go back if you didn't have to? How many of you, how many of, you know, all of us 
are living where we're living in the lifestyle in which we're living because of the fact that we didn't have an option not to that didn't require some sort of massive financial setback, right? It's fascinating, isn't it? So take this stuff seriously, guys, and know that all your customers either are or will be thinking like this too. And then notice where you could maybe like, is this the best version of you? Are you living in the place that makes you the happiest? Is this the best place for your family? Is this the best place? Is this the incarnation of exactly where you wanted to be in your life at this point? And if, if what we're seeing and what we're, Julie and I are sort of prognosticating about as far as what the future landscape might look like, it, you it, Are you going to be part of that? Or are you going to be someone that basically hangs out too long, hoping and praying that things go back to normal? Because they're not going to. COVID you know, therapy or vaccine aside, psychologically, people are now realizing that they don't have to be beholden to this old set of rules anymore. Neither do you. And that means, in my opinion, an absolute explosion of real estate in more ways than we've ever seen before. Lots are going to start selling. People are going to start looking to do, you know, live in places like Montana that no one would ever really considered before. And, you know, unless they're really rugged at heart, people are going to start moving outside of these really expensive areas with pocketfuls of cash if they move quick before the properties devalue. And then you're going to see all different lifestyles that are going to start emerging that are all going to be based on people choosing, you know, frankly, happiness and health and a sense of well-being more than maybe what the value set they had before. So this is the type of thing that I'm feeling from our coaching calls. I'm reading from what you guys post. And at the same time, I feel and I read the pain that some of you are experiencing because you're still holding on so tight to this belief that things are going to go back to the way they, they were. Look, the masks and the social distancing, that's just the short story. The long story is what happens over the rest of our lifetimes with, and our children's right with regards to basically the new rules that people are now able to adapt to. They don't have to live like, frankly, their parents did or their grandparents did. They now can choose to live these extraordinary lives. Well, here, how about this? Do people even need to live in the United States? Maybe you are able to work virtually and you can work wherever you want to work in the world. Maybe there's some sort of big trend where people start, you know, living at different lake houses, you know, VRBOing. Who knows, right? It's exciting. It's fun. And it's, it's something that, it, look, I'm probably way ahead of my skis with some of my predictions and some of the thoughts that Julie and I have been having. But I know it's not so far ahead of my skis that some of these things won't come true. And what is going to happen, and it already is happening, are these changes are happening incredibly fast. So the things that you see, these little micro trends that Julie and I talk about on our podcast and you guys are experiencing in your own, own lives, normally those things would take a decade, 20, 30 years to actually adapt because the old way of doing things was holding on so tight. Now the old way of doing things can't hold on so tight. And now you're seeing um, a new way of basically everybody's going to start um, you know, looking at their possibilities. I just had this thought pop in my head, so I'll share it with you guys. Look at, for example the way uh, Tesla sells cars, right? For the longest time, you needed to have a big ass, and these were mostly, you guys will find this surprising, but cities would set up um, specific areas of town where all the car dealerships had to be. So if you wanted to build a car dealership, you had to build it in this part of town where it's already zoned in and that's where it was gonna be. And you guys, in every town, have you noticed where all the car dealerships are there? That's why. Um, so the big in the in the United States, the people want you know, instant gratification. So you walk into your you know your Toyota lot and you want to pick out the car you want. There's five to choose from. You choose it and you drive off that day. That's not the way it's done in the rest of the world. And what Tesla has proven is it doesn't have to be done that way. So what does that mean? Tesla then obviously opened up these retail locations and they opened them up in malls and they opened them up in places where it, people were naturally you know migrating and they didn't have big inventory stockpiles. They didn't have all the carrying costs. They didn't have to buy all these big commercial lots. They didn't have to have these army of salespeople. All the rules changed. And now you walk in, you check out whatever Tesla you're thinking about buying. And Julie and I don't own a Tesla, but it's a great example of a business that evolved really, really quick and changed the industry. And eXp Realty is the exact same thing, by the way. eXp Realty, without a doubt, is going to be the world's most dominant real estate broker. There's going to be no comparison. And I said the world. They're expanding globally because the business model that they have is made for this market. And it's going to be even more true in the future. By the way, if you want to talk with, uh, about uh, joining Julie and I's eXp Realty family, we are with eXp Realty, um, and just text me directly and let's talk. It's 512-758-0206, 512-758-0206. Just text me and we'll talk about eXp. We'll see if it's a good fit for you. By the way, it is, but you know, I'll show you that um, when, you, when we speak. 
But with regards to like, for example, when Elon Musk decided in Texas, of all places, that he was going to open up these retail locations and malls and whatnot, the Texas Dealers Association literally sued them and prevented them from doing it until a judge finally overturned it and allowed Tesla to do that. But that's the old world trying to keep these new you know, interlopers, Tesla, from breaking the mold. Now the mold is broken. Are people really going to want to go to these big, you know, sort of commercial outlier lots and walk lots and deal with salespeople and the whole thing? You, or versus walking to the Tesla store saying, "I want that one." You sit down with the guy, you order in your, you know, the computer, and it shows up in a month because they build it for you. You guys getting it? You know, a Tesla has all these built-in, um, you know, reverse uh, guarantees. Like if you don't like the Tesla, I think within the first forty-eight hours you can return it, and they give you all your money back. Moral of the story here, guys, is that is the progression of an industry that was very difficult to move forward. And EXP has done the same thing for residential real estate. You know, all these different online schools are happening with schools. This is what's happening, but it's happening at a faster clip. It took Elon Musk, I don't even know what, 10 years to make it so he could have retail locations in, in pretty much every state now. But look how fast everything has changed now because of COVID, less than six months. Because people have, don't have a choice. That's kind of incredible. So where are the other changes going to be as pertains to real estate? I think it's obvious. You know, you're going to have to become really adept at doing video presentations. You're going to have to become really adept at, frankly, being able to sell professionally. You know, being able to sell something based on other things other than your relationship with the seller. Otherwise, you're going to be toast. If you have to do a, a listing presentation on a Zoom and you have no listing presentation or it's what the version of what you've been doing where you just go in there and try to romance them and do a cat and monkey show based on you have some social connection of some variety versus somebody else rolls in and they have a formal presentation, how are you going to compete? You're not. It's not going to work, right? This is just a reality. But those of you who get it are going to have an unfair advantage uh, going forward, especially into next year because – most of our industry is still going to be holding on, hoping that it returns to pre-COVID uh, ways of doing business. Our industry, generally speaking, is slow to adapt. Well, here you go. Look at eXp Realty. eXp Realty is, what, over uh, 10 years old. And they're almost doubling in size and agent count every single year. eXp Realty is going to go from, I think, I don't remember where it started this year, but it's going to end up with over 40,000 agents this year. And some people are now guessing it's going to end up with over 100,000 agents next year. If you guys don't, if you put that in context, it took Keller Williams something like 25 years or something to get to 160,000 agents. And now their agent count is falling. EXP Realty agents count is increasing and it's increasing exponentially, thus EXP, by the way. And then look at the stock. The stock started EXPI, the stock for EXP Realty started this year in the $8 range. And now this morning it opened at $41 because not just the real estate industry is realizing that EXP is the new way of doing business, but investors are seeing it. The world is seeing it. This is what I mean when you when I'm trying to convince you guys to be attached to what will become. And you can look, and I miss it as much as you do. Changes are not easy for any of us. You know, I, I was looking forward to Zoe walking to school. Well, she wouldn't have walked, but going to school with her little, you know, Wonder Woman lunchbox or whatever it would have been. I was looking forward to seeing that. But I have to tell you, I like a lot better coming downstairs in the morning and seeing Zoe sitting there with her mom uh, going to virtual school, knowing she's going to be done in two or three hours and knowing that she's not going to have to be, you know, and after that, we're going to take her someplace where she can have fun. I like that better for the entire family. We're not offshoring basically the raising of our child, right? We're doing it ourselves. And the relationship we're forming with her as a result, what are the ramifications of that going forward? The fact that she wasn't put into this environment where basically she was being raised by a, uh, you know, a bunch of strangers. Isn't that fascinating? Who knows, right? <laughs> Maybe we do a worse job than had she gone to school. I don't know. Time will tell. But in the meantime, guys, hopefully this has motivated you. Be excited about the changes that are happening. Embrace the, the, you know, the tail end of the seller's market. Embrace the fact that you guys are going to be at the leading edge if you stay attached to Julie and I listen to this podcast every day. It continues to be the number one listened to daily podcast for real estate agents in the United States. Continue to stay attached to what will come. You look, we can celebrate and we can all be you know, joyful that we are all part of this interesting time in history where things change from the old to the new. But don't be afraid of it because you can be relevant. Matter of fact, the greatest fortunes in the history of man, going all the way back four or 5,000 years here, guys, have always been made during the greatest times of change. 
And look, a fortune might not be something you're trying to pursue. Maybe that doesn't motivate you, but the reality of it is, is what fortune leads to is freedom. It, le- it doesn't have to be a big fortune. It can be a small fortune, but the fortune comes from your dominant thought being you're here to be of service to other people. And as long as you stay attached to that, and as long as you remind yourself that your highest and truest purpose on this planet is to be of service to other people, then you won't find this natural resistance to wanting to change and wanting to learn. You're going to be excited about it because you want to be in tune with what your highest and truest purpose is, which is being of service to other people. I know you know what I'm talking about because it is a core level truth amongst all of us. So if there's anything we can do for you guys, please remember we're always here. We're interested in your feedback. We're interested in your questions. We're interested in helping you at the highest level. Feel free to text me at 512-758-0206, 512-758-0206. If you're enjoying this podcast, which tens of thousands of you do, please remember to give us a five-star review on iTunes, on an hour everywhere, Spotify. I mean, I don't even know how many different places you guys uh, download us from, Stitcher. Uh, But give us a five-star review because especially on iTunes, when you do that, iTunes then with their little funky algorithm will then let other agents around the world know about the podcast. And that helps us to stay in tune with what our highest and truest purpose on this planet is, which is being of service to all of you guys. You are the group of people that we chose, we have chosen, or we've been chosen to, who knows, to be of service to. That's how we actually think and we feel. So if there's anything we can do for you guys at any time, the quickest and easiest way is just to text me. And yes, I get a lot of texts and yes, I respond to all of them. And sometimes it takes me a day, but I do get back 512-758-0206, 512-758-0206. In the meantime, you guys have a fantastic day and we'll talk with you on the show tomorrow. This program has been a presentation by Tim and Julie Harris, Real Estate Coaching. For more information on our real estate coaching and training programs, visit our website at timandjulieharris.com. Remember to tune in weekdays at noon for upcoming shows. And until next time, thank you for listening to Real Estate Coaching Radio with Tim and Julie Harris. This podcast is a part of the C-Suite Radio Network. For more top business podcasts, visit c-suiteradio.com.